As the sun sets on one breakfast show in 2002, it was rising on another. Channel 4 decided it was time for a change, and here's what happened to the replacement. Rise. So in episode two, we documented how the big breakfast had periods of the show that were slipping a bit and then a refresh happened, but then two times in a row, the refresh backfired and the show ended up returning to a similar format to what it had ditched. Although the big breakfast had saved itself twice before, it had suffered another spaff in audience levels from the last refresh in 2001. It rolled back and continued the format that worked for Johnny and Denise, but they didn't have their star hosts with the mad chemistry they were known for. This could have been overcome by some fundamental show changes, switching up the format and taking some bold steps that they haven't tried before, thinking of some new ideas, getting some fresh-faced production staff and writers, more versatile hosts and a little bit more patience from Channel 4. What they had was acceptable, but it wasn't exceptional, and things, to be honest, just weren't clicking, so Channel 4 pretty much had had enough and they axed the show. Channel 4 were hoping that Princess Productions, who they commissioned to produce a new breakfast show, wouldn't go down the same route and it would start a fresh new breakfast show called Rise. Just to put things into perspective on the other side, here's a rewind on a few things. Since 1993, GMTV took over from TVAM. As I mentioned before, figures weren't really the issue for TVAM's closure, it was the franchise round. So, after the dust had settled, GMTV realised that they were having issues with audiences. The TVAM format should have probably been kept in retrospect. GMTV's format was more news-based, but it didn't get the attention they had hoped for, with the audience dropping off. Things hadn't always been successful for TVAM though. In 1983 when it launched it went for the hard news approach with some conversational features and it wasn't looking promising. TVAM's turnaround came when programme director Greg Dyke created a format based around popular features. He left in 1984 when The Egg Murderer came in, and fast forward 10 years later in 1993, Greg Dyke would do the same thing at GMTV where he was the chairman of the board. That means this time it would be GMTV's go to have a rollback. The set, for instance, would look more like its predecessor's set, and the presenting style and format would look like an updated version of what would have been removed from the screens not even four months before in January. The channel stuck with the format with a couple of set feature updates uh, until 2010 when they launched a new show called Daybreak. By this time the ITV franchises had been eaten up by the whole ITV PLC thing, just like the other companies such as Meridian and Yorkshire Television. I could bang on about this bit but actually to be fair it's not really relevant because we're looking at the TV atmosphere in 2002 and 2003 but in short, in 2010 they'd launched Daybreak which failed and then it changed into Good Morning Britain. On the other other side, BBC Breakfast News would remain in the same format until 1997 when it had a refresh. The content was pretty much the same, but the studio was a lot less flashier than its previous set. The old one was mostly computer generated with a blue screen, but you wouldn't see that because that's the whole point of a blue screen. This one was an actual set. In 2000 it would start looking and sounding a little more familiar to what we're used to today and in 2001 they'd introduce some sofas. The tone would be lightened up a bit and in 2002 a familiar face would join Natasha Kaplinsky. No stranger to breakfast presenting Dermot Murnahan. By 2003 that's when that iconic big red sofa was brought in and other than a few updates with the hosts and the show set the format has pretty much stayed the same. It's only really had some subtle updates to reflect the technology of the day and to keep it looking modern. Hello, good morning. Welcome to Breakfast with Sally Nugent. By this time we had Channel 5 and over on 5 they had Milkshake. Go 
going strong from its launch and doing the thing that the other channels weren't doing at that point is Channel 5's Milkshake. It had kids programs from 6am and the chances were in 2003 onwards if you had kids then you'd probably be watching that in the morning or one of the satellite channels. By this time DJ Cat was sent to the puppet retirement home along with Roland Rat, Ed the Duck, Gordon the Gopher, that banana one that they had on CBBC for a bit the spitting image puppets the riddlers the whole cast of the fun fracture including that fucked up looking seal i don't even know why it existed in the first place and even zig and zag eventually actually to be fair they would eventually end up on cbbc at one point because there was a an animated show called zig and zag don't forget sky news and itv news were things at that point they were both available on freeview so they were also an option if you were really into your breakfast news or just news at breakfast first time so in 2002 bbc looked like this gmtv looked like this and starting at 6 55 until 9 a.m on the 29th of april 2002 channel 4 looked like this <laughs> The first thing that viewers didn't want to hear was the new host, Mark Durden Smith, moaning about the previous show. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to Rise. We are coming to you from a fancy, high tech <laughs> studio in fashionable Hounslow. There are no puppets, dancing girls, or whooping crew members of the man hyperactive. Probably because we actually quite like what they just axed. Don't go slating a show that was mostly successful on your first day when you've barely achieved anything. He'd barely been on air for two minutes. The show was basically trying to do the bits that they thought were good about the Big Breakfast, but then leaving out the bits that they wanted to distance themselves from. Also at the same time though, trying to be a little more tabloid in the Big Breakfast. They would have features such as the lie detector test called Strap Me Down where people would test their friends or loved ones to see if they were lying. Hey, that's brilliant! That's not like it was ever going to be a problem, is it? Basically, like the show was saying, Hey, do you trust your friends? Put them on a lie detector test on our show. Anyway, the show would be hosted by Mark Durden Smith, who was a sports presenter and researcher previous to his role on Rise. After Rise, he would continue to present an I'm a Celebrity spin off, covering this morning as well as more sports work and a show called Wish You Were Here Now and Then. This was special to him because his mum is Judith Chalmers. Other hosts included Edith Bowman, TV and radio presenter, and she would join Radio 1 during her time at Rise and would also host a show with Colin Murray, replacing Mark and Lars' afternoon show on Radio 1 in 2004. She would continue her radio and podcast work as she does these days. Colin Murray was a radio presenter and his previous work included presenting on Radio Ulster and Radio 1 since 19. 99 and some journalism work before that colin went on to radio 5 live and bbc sports and is currently the host of countdown kirsty gallagher was a sports presenter and she would do the sports segment on rise as well as being one of the main hosts rise was a joint venture with b sky b which would mean that kirsty gallagher coming from sky was one of their talent that they wanted to transfer over she presented a couple of shows some on sky sports some on sky sports news and also sky version of you've been framed she would stay on sky sports until 2018 in 2015 she went to strictly and then uh, she joined the rat factory in 2021 where she presented the breakfast show with simon mccoy which seems a bit of an odd pairing but there you go seems to be what they did at the time and uh, also she left by december because she had a benign brain tumor causing her tinnitus which simon mccoy must have been kind of happy about because he's got the look of a man that would be very pleased to find out that he wasn't the fault that she's got a horrible tone in her ear which is a much better sound that comes from GB News in the first place. Liz Bonin had previously hosted shows on RTE, and after Rise, she would present more science-based shows such as Bang Goes the Theory, Autumn Watch, Big Blue Live, Stargazing, and some other BBC shows. The Rise News reader Chris Rogers used to present Newsround in the mid-90s. He became a newsreader for Sky in 1998, and because it was a joint venture with Sky, he became the newsreader on Rise. After Rise, he'd go to ITV News and then BBC News. He'd go on to get some awards for his current affairs and kids' TV programming. 
Now, the way they presented the news was very interesting. I'm not a fan. I don't think it worked because I think it was too jumpy. But basically, the first thing that happened was uh, Chris Rogers would stand in front of this big screen and it would say um, what the main news story was. But every time the headline came up, it did a close shot of his face. And then when he explained what it was, it would all go to a long shot, which is too much jump cuts for me. I think it needed a bit less of that. The other thing is that he was walking around um, the screen, which wasn't a thing until a couple years later on the other channels. And that if you look at the set of Good Morning Britain, you can see a lot of similarities, especially where the desk is placed and the other things around it. But this predated Good Morning Britain by about 12 years. Now here's another bunch of information that you might not have known uh, around 2002's rise. This isn't necessarily in order, but I've tried to do it. But um, the thing is, uh, with information like this, sometimes I can't find a for sure timeline. But anyway, at some point, Colin was the first to leave the show. And I'm pretty sure Tara Palmer Tompkinson uh, was a regular at some point. Uh, I just wanted to bring this up also quickly. I found this clip of Rise that it says it's from 2003 featuring uh, Richard Blackwood and also Darren Brown, who was the guest. Uh, but the thing is, that can't be 2003 because on January the 20th, 2003, they had a relaunch. But um, I'm going to get into that uh, in a bit. Uh, Richard Blackwood isn't listed anywhere as a permanent host or even as a temporary one. So I'm uh, not really sure where he fits in, but he was a presenter. I believe that because he is sat in Mark's position here. Um, secondly, uh, there seem to be some regular features that popped in uh one of those was a comedian called tom bins uh you may have heard of him before he did ivan brackenbury and a couple of other stuff but um he's got some convictions uh recently which i'm not going to go into all you have to know is that he is a terrible guy but anyway they sent him to australia i think to do the uh, i'm a celebrity reporting and they did a show where they had a segment where they had an interview on a roller coaster. There was one called Iron Guts, and that was an eating contest, and you had to eat as much gross food as you could. This is only stuff that I can find that people have wrote about on the internet somewhere, um, most specifically a website called Tracks.tv, which logs some of the episodes. Apparently, they announced on Friday the 6th of December 2002 that... Um, they were going to get rid of the presenters they were going to replace them and uh, looking back at the show logs from uh, a couple of months before that from uh, about october-ish that um a lot of the features looked a bit disjointed and um, there was lots of like inner studio stuff happening uh weird behavior from some people as well it just seemed a bit odd for a tv program that wasn't trying to be like big breakfast but there you go in any other show, I'd say Mark was a good presenter, and he is technically a good presenter. Um, in my opinion, I'm not so sure on this show. Um, it doesn't have the right feeling with him. He doesn't bring the feeling, but also the, the show should have a feeling to it. Um, that's probably one of the reasons why it didn't last as long as it could have done. And I want to put my experience into perspective here, because I've got a TV and film diploma. I've also got a BA ONS in radio production. I've done various voiceover work and also worked on radio stations so i'd like to feel like i've got a good understanding about how this kind of stuff works as well as doing lots of research for stuff like this so yeah if i was the person who was doing the casting for this i wouldn't have cast him on the basis that um, he doesn't bring the right feeling to the show so on the basis of being a tv critic i would sum up what was known as series one of rise as a vibeless big breakfast wannabe and that it tried too hard i'd also say that it was trying to be an edgy channel for daily as well none of which did it succeed of doing it's clear what they were doing wasn't working so in the old days they'd have done a rollback channel four were mega adamant that the big breakfast wasn't coming back so what do you do while you make rise as close to the big breakfast as you can get it obviously you can do a carbon copy because channel 4 will get quite cross you know getting rid of a show and then having it come back again no maybe you could set it in a flat and maybe instead of it being in the countryside maybe have it in the middle of london or something like that
also to emphasize how not like the big breakfast it is uh what they did is got two hosts that didn't resemble anything like johnny vaughan or denise van outen and they didn't put them near some white patio doors that they could go in and out of and they didn't put a couple of chairs in front of them with a television screen in fact to show you how not like the big breakfast it is i'm just gonna flip the screen a minute see nothing like it there are no puppets dancing girls or whooping crew members and yeah Okay, I was doing that to make a point, but listen, Ian Lee is a brilliant broadcaster. He had previous experience with stand-up comedy and radio, and he was joined by sole survivor from the original Rise, Edith Bowman. But she would call it a day a month later in February 2003, just like The Big Breakfast, they were hedging their bets on one presenter on the survival of the show, and she left. Nevertheless, Kate Lawler took over from Edith and Kate was the winner of Big Brother Series 3 the year before. This was the same year that Alison Hammond, Jade Goody and Adele Roberts had all taken part. This made sense because Big Brother was a big thing on Channel 4 back then and having an experienced host was really helpful and if anything, Big Brother was a chance for her to show off her personality. She was a great match with Ian and I thought they had some chemistry but the rest of the show, well that didn't and I think the proof of that was between 8 30 and 9 o'clock every day because mel and sue took the presenting reins yeah they actually had mel gedroich and sue perkins presenting for the final 30 minutes of the show and by this point they'd been a comedy and presenting double act for quite a few years presenting their own shows and their chemistry was notoriously off the hook so it should have worked but just like Ian and Kate, something under the hood wasn't clicking and the show was missing that special thing that made it work. The show's tabloid nature was off and even just by looking at it, I couldn't tell you who the audience was supposed to be. By the way, if you think that the studio looks familiar, that's because they used to record the right stuff from there. There were two other regulars on the show. One was Zora Suleiman, and uh, she'd done various TV work, including acting and also news reading, and small time shows as a guest or something. Now, uh, one of those shows will be Flipside TV. I'm going to go into Flipside TV next year. It was on around the same time period as Rise was. Um, and also, Zora Suleiman used to be an associate producer and a little fun fact Richard Bacon was executive producer and presenter on Flipside TV but you'll notice there are a few familiar faces on it mainly because Flipside TV would be a great place to entry television if you were a critic or if you're a comedian Anyway, back to Rise. There was another regular host, and that is Dougie Anderson. And here's the thing. The presence of Dougie Anderson proves that chemistry is not the problem. Chelsea versus Man City. I thought I watched this. Keep it going. So I watched the football on the telly the other day. It turns out it was a match from about five years ago. What a waste of time. Thank you. Here come the blues. Here come the reds. It's a football match. It's a football match. He scored a goal. He saved a goal. It's a football match, it's a football match Goalkeeper in back, attackers up in front The referees in black, something key is a character Come on the reds, come on the blues It's a football match Yay! Since Rise finished, Douglas Anderson has done a heck ton of stuff, uh, loads of online things. All you have to do is have a look for him, but he's uh, also done some stand-up comedy. He's done some writing, video making, podcasting, all sorts of stuff. Just look for him on the internet and you'll find him. Rise was absolutely obsessed with Big Brother. Not only did it talk about Big Brother quite a lot, uh, but it also had some of the people who were evicted from the house and also people from previous series involved in the show. And they'd also have their own features. John Tickle, for instance, would uh, take part in many games. But other than that, um, lots of the entertainment content would be actually pretty much what was going on in the Big Brother house and... If they had a celebrity guest in, they'd normally talk to them about Big Brother. Uh, yeah, they'd have the regular stuff about, you know, what are you doing now? What's your latest thing? What's the thing you're plugging? But most of it was pretty much about Big Brother or for a very short time, David Blaine and his time hanging up in a box somewhere. John Tickle would end up being a regular on the show, but actually not being one of the main hosts. He was just hanging around, really. 
He would end up going to other shows such as Sky's Brainiac, in which he proved that although man could not walk on water, he could walk on custard. Things were clearly not good for Rise. It was like they were banging their head against a brick wall and going nowhere. And by September 2003, it was announced that the show would be axed. And it lasted until December. Those of you with calendars would realise that that's less than a two-year run, which was less than the Channel 4 Daily. Now, what I think the main issue is, is the content of the show. Because firstly, when Big Brother was on, it went full on Big Brother. And when other things were happening, such as David Blaine's thing and um, some other big Channel 4 program, they would talk about that, but they go full on with it. Now, the problem is, if I'm not interested in those things, I'm going to get really annoyed and turn over the channel. I can listen to what the Big Brother contestants are doing by switching over to BBC Radio 1 or something. Like, that content was elsewhere, as well as Channel 4 in the evenings. I don't want to be bombarded all day with Big Brother. That's the first problem. The second one is that the content that they were doing wasn't necessarily entertaining. Now, the hosts were entertaining and that's their job. But the problem is that there wasn't anything going on in the background or like a, a thing to look forward to a bit later. It was just conversation with this guy, conversation with that woman. It was just the same old thing all the time. It's like the people who should have been trying weren't trying. Have a studio thing. Get the audience thinking about something. Talk about a place in the country. Play a game. Do something different. Get something that's actually going to grab the attention of your audience and keep them. One of the reason breakfast radio works and also the big breakfast was it was that water cooler moment where you'd go and have a chat about what you heard or what you saw yesterday or this morning. And I think that's what Ian Lee tried to do, especially with stuff like drinking chilli sauce. Next day at work. Oh, did you see that guy? guy who drank chilli sauce live on telly and spewed into the sink. Like, that's that's talkable stuff. I actually think the best part of the show is when they actually have telephone calls in from people watching the show and they ask the celebrities questions. Hello, Alan. All right, man. All right, hey. 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 Whoa, Devon is rocking and rolling. Yeah. Woo. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. yeah are you going to be kicking any butt later on? Yeah. Yeah, wicked. Go so, on, Alan, wicked. how old are you? Um, 25. Oh, are you, are you crazy? Sad. I'm not that crazy. What, are you work? Do you work? <laughs> not at the moment. Um. Alan, have you phoned us before? No, no, no. All right, so you're just at home chilling out today then, doing yeah. nothing. Do you, okay, are you going to go and look for a job today or are you going to uh, just watch, watch uh, Trisha? Uh, I love um, scrounging off the government, you know. No, 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 fair play. I did it for three years. Yeah, well, yeah. It's about, I got the house and benefit as well. Yeah. Uh, you've got a question for Harvey, haven't you? Yeah, I've got um, two actually. One, I think he answered earlier in the show. Well, then so don't he... ask that one. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good question, man. Oh, go on then, man. All right. Right, are you there, bruv? I'm there, bruv. Right, mate. Um, oh, have you got any plans to do any more So Solid releases in the near future? Um, me personally, no. So obviously I'm just concentrating on my own stuff. Like the reason why I think the telephone part is good is because it plays off Ian Lee's strengths. He's been doing this kind of stuff for years. It helps make a connection with the audience, which I think there was an issue with. Social media in 2003 was a completely different atmosphere. It did exist, but not in the same way as it does now. There was no Twitter or Facebook to start with. That means really the only way you could have contacted your audience is via advertising, whether that's through a newspaper, whether that's through your actual television channel, or whether you were to put it up like on a billboard or something. Maybe even some radio advertising, who knows? Uh, now, one main issue that I do think they had, though, was the connection with the people who were just normal. I mean, if you look at this programme, you've got the two main hosts and the guests, and they're all celebrities. What you want to see is somebody that's a bit more like you. And not only that, but for you to be involved in the programme. That was the advantage of having a Keith Chegwin or Mike McLean, because not only do those people get their chance to be on air, but it also fills time that you've got loads and loads of, especially on Rise. I mean, even for 2003 standards, the audience connection and also the content was complete shit. There was absolutely no effort. In fact, it's like that they should have had writers and didn't have any. Or if they did, they've gone, hey, Ian and Kate are funny as fuck, let's let them carry the show. And then just sat back and let it happen. And then the 19th of December 2003 happened. On the 19th of December 2003, the failings of Britain's transport system were exposed as never before. Decades of neglect, 
led to a day of disaster. That clip's actually from a fictional docudrama called The Day Britain Stopped. It was made by the BBC and set on the 19th of December 2003. No, it was actually Rise's last day. Any into his football song? Yeah. Oh, no. sure. I need you boys and girls to join in with me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Come on, the Reds! Come on, the Blues! It's a football match! It's a football match! He scores a goal! He saves a goal! It's a football game! It's a football game! Goalkeeper's in back! Attackers up in front! The referee's in back! So can he is a character! Come on, the Reds! Come on, the Blues! It's a Strangely, similar to the fictional docudrama, there was a pile-up, but this one was in a studio and just people. After Rise, Katie Lawler went on to do some more reality TV shows, then she went to Capital Radio in London, then she worked with Tim Shaw on The Breakfast Show on Kerrang! Radio in Birmingham, where she then got the Drive Time Show and then had The Breakfast Show to herself. She then joined the new Virgin Radio, had a baby, wrote a book and is doing various bits and bobs. As for Ian Lee, uh, well there's two ways I'm going to sum this up. The first way is the quick way, which is that uh, after Rise, He ended up doing more radio work, so that included LBC, Virgin Radio, BBC Three Counties, Talk Radio with a show called The Late Night Alternative, and also uh, Jack FM Breakfast. But in 2022, he retired from radio to focus on his counselling work, which he started during the COVID lockdown. Ian and his friend Catherine Boyle, who used to be his producer, still present shows on Twitch. The long version is that Ian Lee is a fascinating person. Um, He's got an amazing story to tell and when he was on radio and things, we only got a little window into what was going on in his life and stuff. Um, There is a whole load of stuff. So I'm just going to focus on the Rise stuff because there is a load of stuff that I could get through. Um, I've been trying to edit this video for quite some time and actually just got stuck into watching videos of Ian Lee. So um, what I'm going to do is just keep this rise relevant check out beyond the title for the full interview of this okay there was one day when we registered zero viewers we got beaten by noddy quite a lot the big they asked me to host the big breakfast before it ended and i knew it was going to end so i said no rise started for about a year without me and it was mark durden smith it was five people behind a desk and it was very very dry that rise had already tanked So I knew I couldn't do any worse than that. So I didn't feel any pressure. So I had a great time doing it. It killed my TV career, if I'm completely honest. Afterwards, I was told by Channel 4, well, we're never gonna hire you again. I was a drug addict, I was a full-blown drug addict. I would wake up at half three, I'd have a couple of spliffs, Uh, I'd go to work, I'd be home by 10, and then I'd be doing cocaine all day. It's an amazing interview. Um, These clips don't do it justice. So please give the original video a heck ton of views and subscribe to this guy, Josh Barry. Viewing habits have changed a heck ton since 2003. You've got so many different platforms now. And uh, although TV is still the main one, I kind of feel like that just having it on the television isn't a thing anymore. You kind of have to have it on multiple platforms. I've got loads more thoughts on this. I'm going to put it in an extra video after this one. Uh, should be released in the next couple of weeks. Rise was Channel 4's last proper go at breakfast in the mornings. Uh, they did try a couple of other little shows, but... Um, Um, I'm not including them because they weren't the same kind of thing. I've not found much information about how much audience they are currently getting in the morning. Surely it can be brilliant, but it can't be as bad as Rise's figures. Otherwise they'd get another breakfast show, wouldn't they? The TV atmosphere actually hasn't changed uh, for the last 20 years. And what I mean by that is the kind of stuff that's on it. So the TV shows and stuff, 
last 20 years you could probably look at the schedules and they wouldn't actually be that much different which then begs the question when will something change normally what tends to happen is when one thing changes as a domino effect and some other stuff changes as well i'm hoping with the last incarnation of the big breakfast that happened last year that is open channel 4's eyes up a little bit and that it is genuinely a financial factor which is why they haven't brought it back or brought it back yet but i would say channel 4 it's been nearly 20 years get over it get out there try something new there's plenty more fish in the sea. I can't think of anything else to say, so thank you very much for watching the Time for Breakfast trilogy. A big thanks to Joseph Adams, Stephen Bride, Hooter Noodles, Matthew Beckley, Chris Elliott, Manuel Mobius, and Mark Jackson. The executive producers are Tim Goodwin and Computer Tom. I've been Johnny Robinson, and I'll still be Johnny Robinson after this video's finished. Thank you, bye.